today's study tip. I changed it a little bit to make more sense. <laughs> so hopefully, in addition to your regular studying, which I'm sure is our current labs, our current lectures for that week, uh, make sure that you're also leaving yourself some time each week to review previous material. And I would su suggest that you start at the beginning of the unit. So we're currently on unit two. So you would wanna go back and say, okay, unit two starts with endocrine system, chapter 11. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna review my notes, my lecture slides, and the lab material that is related to chapter 11. And this will really help boost your memory, boost connections. It'll help you a lot. Okay, so then if you still have some time, at some point I would say go back to unit one, find those topics that you found really challenging or that you didn't do so well on the exam and master those. And you can ask me for help for any of this, okay? <clears throat> All right, so today we're gonna do the last part of the muscular system. Introduction, all right, so as you remember, we've talked about in lab a little bit, uh, muscle fiber is either on or off, right, during a contraction, and the strength, the force, or the tension uh, of the muscle depends on the number of cross bridges that are being formed. So how many mice and heads are grabbing on to actin um, that's going to dictate how strongly you can contract, okay? And so how do we increase that? We increase that number of myosin uh, to actin or the tension that we produce by motor unit recruitment, right? So remember, that a motor unit is one motor neuron and all the fibers that it commands or it innervates, right? For fine motor control, you're going to have a high ratio of a neuron to fibers, right? So you're not going to have a lot of fibers controlled by each neuron. You're gonna have a small number of fibers. So like one to 10, whereas for uh, large muscle groups like your legs, right? This is a gross motor control. You're going to have a low ratio, like one neuron to a thousand fibers. Those are huge muscle groups and you're not doing anything super precise, right? Um, so uh, speaking and writing would be examples of fine motor control. Um, and I mentioned already walking as gross motor control. And this makes sense when you think about it because think about developing children. Children learn to walk before they learn to hold and properly use utensils, uh, whether that be fork, knife, spoon, um, eating at the dinner table or writing with a pencil, okay? Or even just scribbling and, and uh, whatnot, okay? So uh, more context. Toddlers tend to start uh, using utensils around at the earliest 13 months. That's early. Most not until 17 or 18 months. Okay. However, most babies start to take their first steps sometime between 9 and 12 months. So again, fine motor control takes longer to develop. Examples are writing and speaking. And we have a high ratio, one neuron to 10 fibers, okay? Gross motor control, you're going to have one neuron control, lots of fibers, and the example is walking. Okay, and you saw this in lecture and you've seen this in your book, but recall that a motor unit, right? You start with your motor neuron, so at the cell bodies and the spinal cord, the axon extends all the way to the muscle. Okay, here it looks short, but of course this could be long if you're talking about your calf, your foot, right? Okay, so then you're going to have lots of the endings 
attach at the neuromuscular junction, right? So shown here more closely, okay? And so this one motor neuron is showing three junctions. It could have, you know, 10, it could have lots, right? Hundreds if it was gross uh, control. And so that's your, your motor unit, one neuron, motor neuron, and all of the muscle fibers or muscle cells that it touches and controls. By having this junction, this uh, motor neuron controls that muscle cell. Okay. So, to prevent fatigue, right, so that you can keep using your muscles and not have them give out on you, we take turns with the fibers in the muscle. And so we have asynchronous recruitment of motor units. So some of the fibers in the, in the whole muscle will be on while others are off. When they're off, they're able to get rid of waste, replenish all the things that they need to be able to contract like ATP, right? You need your calcium to be um, put back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? All the, all the details that we learned about. And then they will be ready to work again. And we don't just go back and forth between two because then you would have um, a gap, right? You wouldn't be able to sustain a constant uh, contraction. So we have lots of different um, motor units taking turns. And so there's always going to be enough motor units on at a time to sustain whatever amount of force that is that you need, okay? So examples, like I said, to uh, prevent waste, well, we'll actually be talking about fatigue uh, a lot more, but during maximal tension, and maximal tension is tricky. So there's a maximal tension that you can um, you can recruit under normal circumstances, and that's about I think it's one third of what you actually have as a muscle. But in order to get the rest of that and to actually reach a hundred percent maximal tension, you would have to have. Um, complete, um, you need to have activation of your sympathetic nervous system, get that rush of epinephrine to override our normal, um, the way it normally works, okay? So maximal tension is to have all of your motor units on, which again is not something you do, even when you're at the gym and you try to lift like the heaviest weight that you possibly can, and you feel like you're exerting all of your possible strength, it's not actually 100% of your motor units. Only if you have full sympathetic nervous system stimulation can you actually recruit 100% of your motor units. So examples is when you see these crazy stories of strength like the mother uh, actually lifting a car off of her child, for example. She can't do that for very long, just a few uh, seconds long enough to, to get the baby out, right? Or a child, hopefully not a baby. Um, but again, so stories of amazing strength is when there's uh, lots of epinephrine um, overriding our normal system so that you can actually recruit 100%. So super cool. Super cool. Okay. What else did I want to tell you? That's good for now. Okay. So energy requirements in order to have your muscle contractions, obviously you need ATP, okay? ATP is important for both the energy to have your power stroke, right? But also to allow detachment of myosin from actin so that you can have another cycle, right? You also um, need to be able to pump the calcium out of the sarcoplasm back into the SR, okay? And so that's the ATPase pump, or circa, remember? Okay, um, 
turns out about 75% of ATP in our muscles are actually wasted as, as heat, although it's not truly waste because we need to have maintain our body temperature, right? Uh, so that's a little misleading, I suppose. Um, sources of ATP. Of course, you know, you have your mitochondria, but you also, turns out, convert all of your extra ATP, because remember, you cannot store ATP. So it's converted to creatine phosphate, and during contraction, we take a phosphate from creatine and put it onto ADP, and then we can make ATP very quickly. Meanwhile, of course, your mitochondria will be trying to make ATP. And then if you're exceeding oxygen, um, if you need energy faster than you can get oxygen to your muscles, then you'll kick in with uh, anaerobic respiration. Okay, so ATP plus CP, CP for creatine phosphate. This um, can give you energy. So the ATP you already have in your muscle plus the creatine that you have, this can give you a burst of energy for 10 to 30 seconds. And that, that tends to be enough time to allow all the other processes um, to, to give you the ATP that you need. Right, so to take more, to make more ATP, you need either your mitochondria or you're only going through glycolysis, which would be anaerobic respiration. Just depends on how hard and for how long you've been working, what the conditions are like inside the cell. Okay, so again, instant energy uh, in small amounts, you can, you can use your creatine phosphate and then you'll replenish those once you stop working um, you'll have ATP that continues to be released for a short amount of time at very high levels, and then that will be converted and you'll re restock your creatine phosphate stores. Okay, so we also talked about this in lab um, this week. So a little review about summation. Okay, so if you are quickly shocking Okay, we shock in the in the lab for experiments, and then in the body we would be using neurotransmitters, right? Acetylcholine. Okay, but if you quickly shock before the uh, relaxation phase has com been completed, you will stimulate another um, twitch, and because you didn't fully relax the twitch is actually going to be stronger than the first one. And you can keep getting that up into up to a certain point, you will plateau, okay? So let's go through this. You have your normal muscle twitch up here in pink, okay? And you stimulate contraction, you generate force, and then you completely relax and go back to rest, okay? And this is your stimulus, which is what caused the muscle twitch. Okay. But down here in the bottom, you have a stimulus, you start that muscle twitch, and before it's gone back to rest, you shocked it again. And so now you're, in a sense, piggybacking off of the first one, you have a higher, more intense um, force, right? You have more force. And if you continue to shock it faster and faster, you'll continue to see this effect and until you get to a plateau you've reached your max tension okay so recall tetanus right this is what we're talking about wave summation when you hear wave summation you think tetanus and you ask which one incomplete or complete okay so if you're just shocking it towards the end of the relaxation period you're going to see this very jagged pattern right you still reach that plateau where you don't get any more force. Uh, so you got full wave summation, but it is not smooth. We would not want this if we were trying to actually do something, right? Because then, uh, like you're trying to raise your arm and it starts to fall back down, then you raise it more and you starts to fall back down, you raise it more, right? That'd be annoying. It'd be very difficult to ever get anything done that way. 
Now over here, it's much smoother. You have 10 shocks per second instead of five. Um, you don't have as jagged, so the relaxation phase is even less. But until you go fast enough to completely skip the relaxation phase, right? So you have to go really fast and completely skip relaxation. No relaxation at all. That's when you get this completely smooth line and that's complete tetanus. Of course, if you're doing that for too long, you will reach fatigue and you'll see a decline in your force you generate. Okay. All right. So what, what's actually happening when we talk about the fatigue of the muscle? We know that means that you can't generate any more force. You see a decline. So all, if we say all the motor units are in use. Um, and again, this is where it gets tricky because we have uh, this difference between all the motor units you can actually recruit under nor normal circumstances, which is not actually all that your muscle has, but it's all that you can do. Okay, so it's the maximum force you're able to exert. Okay. Now, the immediate fatigue that you experience, like when you're lifting weights and then your arms start to shake um, you, and you're losing that force and you're not able to hold it up, okay? This is due to an accumulation of extracellular potassium. And you might be saying, whoa, we haven't been talking about potassium this whole chapter, what's going on? Okay, so recall we talked about action potentials in our neuro neuro chapter and we are talking about those still okay so when you have an action potential you depolarize the depolarizations from the influx of sodium and in order to repolarize so that you can get another action potential eventually you need to repolarize the cell and we do that by having a bunch of potassium rush out. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. So an accumulation of extracellular potassium that's due to potassium leaving your axons, um, your muscle fibers during the repolarization phase. Okay, so repolarization phase of action potentials. That's where the potassium is coming from. Because we have our sodium potassium pumps, it's not going to take long at all to restore our concentrations. So this will be a very brief fatigue. You need typically less than one minute to be able to restore uh, to normal. Uh, longer fatigue, however, right, after you've done a full workout, you've really pushed yourself, Okay, <laughs> like this person on the floor. Now you've had a lot more processes happening for a lot longer amount of time. And so examples, you, um, you broke down your phosphocreatine and you have a buildup of your phosphate um, groups, okay? Um, you might also have a, a loss of glycogen. You've burned through your glycogen reserves in your muscle. Now we don't quite know exactly how that's related, but we know there's a relationship between burning through your glycogen in your muscle and no longer being able to release sufficient amount of calcium to get more muscle contractions, okay? And then we also see that there's a decline in ATP the decline in ATP is primarily just for your fast twitch muscles. We will see this again, like the difference between fast and slow twitch muscles at the end of this lecture. Okay, so during short intense bursts of exercise, ATP may be used faster than it can be replenished. And Again, that's when you use your phosphocreatine, right? But it's short burst, okay? Rapid renewal of ATP is accomplished by combining the ADP with the phosphate from the phosphocreatine, 
We also call phosphocreatine, you may hear it referred to as creatine phosphate, same thing. During rest, as I mentioned earlier, the depleted reserves of your uh, creatine is replenished um, by taking the excess a ATP that you have and doing the reverse process, turning it back into uh, phosphate creatine. Both processes, going from creatine phosphate to ATP and then the reverse, those are both performed by the same enzyme and it the direction that it goes is dependent on the concentration. So if you have a lot of ADP uh, lying around, then your enzyme is going to automatically start taking your creatine and making more ATP. And then vice versa, when you get a lot of ATP, then you will start to, to make more creatine, okay? And that enzyme, is also has two names, unfortunately, uh, creatine kinase, CK, um, or it might be creatine phosphokinase, CPK. Okay, um, why we have two sets of names for all of this? Research was happening simultaneously, and you had a, a large subset with one and with the other, and it just kind of happens. Okay. So you see this with kind of older topics, you tend to have more than one name. Newer topics, we're very good about being more consolid consolidated. Okay, moving forward, uh, creatine. What is this? What is this phosphate creatine we keep talking about? Creatine is produced in the liver and the kidneys. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about is taking um, creatine supplements safe? Is it good? Does it help performance? You know, pros, cons. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so more about fatigue. So these longer fatigue situations, this would be um, absolute true fatigue of the muscle, but it turns out that what you experience as fatigue after a workout is not true fatigue of your muscle. It's actually what we call central fatigue. This is from your upper motor units, from the brain that then command the lower motor neurons. Um, there tends to be less of this ac action or ability of the upper mo motor neurons to command the lower or activate the lower motor neurons. And so the muscles themselves are not truly fatigued, but it has the same effect, right? You're not able to keep telling your muscles to, to run. Um, okay, there's a lot that's unknown about this um, central fatigue um, process. It's very complex. We're still learning a lot about it. I hypothesize that this mechanism might be in place um, as a protection, right? So what if you, you're you working, you know, maybe you, you have a physical labor job or you just, you do a workout, whatever, um, and you've exhausted yourself to the point of central fatigue, but then some emergency situation arises and you need to be able to run for your life or fight right? Well, if your muscles were truly absolutely fatigued, you would be helpless and you wouldn't be able to do anything. So I wonder, and I assume that this central fatigue is actually a backup system, a built-in um, system to protect us so that if we're in a situation we could actually still use our muscles and get away and survive. So that's kind of neat, right? All right. Physical conditioning, you can, and of course you all know this because everyone is aware of athletes, right? Um, you can continue to train and build up more and more endurance so that you don't reach that central fatigue as quickly, okay? Um, so there are two types of endurance training. There's anaerobic 
This would be sprinting and weightlifting. You're gonna get enlargement of the muscle. You're, this enlargement of the muscles due to having more myofibrils. Um, remember that your myofibril are the, the bundles of actin and myosin within your muscle cell. Okay, so that's what this picture is here, just to remind you. Um, and then aerobic, aerobic endurance means being able to train your muscles to work longer with less oxygen, so oxygen debt. And this means then if you're going to need to be able to supply oxygen for longer amounts of time, right, uh, like endurance running, you're going to need to increase the number of capillaries to the muscle so that you can actually get more blood and more oxygen um, to the muscle for a longer amount of time, okay? So aerobic endurance, our examples are swimming, cycling, running, okay? Uh, aerobic activities, uh, anything high intensity for 15 minutes or more where you have a very high oxygen demand and you will actually run out of oxygen, right? You won't have enough to sustain that high, high level, high and long period of time. So each week you can actually do a little bit more distance, right? A little bit longer time because your body has added more capillaries. And so if you wanted to train for a marathon or let's be real, let's train for a half, half marathon first, right? You, you're going to get on that treadmill and you're gonna run as long as you can without stopping until you feel fatigued completely. You know, your, uh, your muscles are burning and you just can't keep up anymore. Whatever time that is, you're going to try to do like a few more minutes the next time that you run. Maybe give yourself a day off and then when you come back, you should be able to run a couple more minutes before you reach that point of fatigue. And you do that every every few days, every week, and you eventually get up to your goal. Okay, so that's aerobic endurance, things that are very high oxygen demand for long periods of time. Okay, and we will talk about uh, these differences more also at the end of this PowerPoint, the difference between in, um, endurance and, uh, and very fast, fast twitch and um, endurance twitch. Okay, so what's next? Ah, some time for you to think. Philip is a thin, tall, 29-year-old man he wants to get bigger muscles, likely due to social pressure, right? Thinking that men are supposed to be very bulky, very muscular, okay? Um, so he goes to the health food store and they tell him, yeah, we can get you bulky. You, you just need to add creatine and protein power to your workouts and, and you'll see, you know, 25 percent, you know, muscle gain in just a few weeks, something like that, some sales pitch, right? So this is actually very common. You can talk to almost anybody you know that, that's working out regularly and they'll tell you that they have protein powder supplements or protein bar supplements, um, creatine, all sorts of supplements, right? So focusing on what you've learned about creatine today so far, um, and what you may or may not already know about protein. Uh, describe why these products sound like a really good idea. They sound very convincing um, in bodybuilding, right? Um, but I want you to think about the physiology and explain why it's actually not necessary. It's a waste of money. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to, uh, to think this over. So I want you to pause the video and take as much time as you need. And then when you play it 
I will discuss the answers with you. Okay. All right. So let's start with protein. You need 0.8 grams of protein per every kilogram of your body weight. Now, I know we don't think of our body weight in kilograms, so that would be 0.36, so 0 0.36 grams per pound that you need to consume of protein a day. So that's about 50, 56 grams of protein for the average sedentary man and 46 grams per day for the average sedentary woman. And if you were really trying to build muscle, you could add half a gram of protein per body pound uh, to your diet to bulk up. And this is really easy to do in your diet. If you're to add up all the protein that you eat in a day, you are more than likely exceeding these values already. And you don't need to take these supplements. Uh, what are some good sources of protein? I'm sure you already know milk, dairy products. Um, you know, if you're doing dairy products, a lot of like Greek yogurts are, are really, you know, high in protein. Watch out for that sugar. Watch out for the artificial sugar as well. Um, also, something I think string cheese or mozzarella cheeses are supposed to be lower in fat. Um, so lower in fat, but they still have the protein. Uh, beans, of course, legumes, beans, you know, those are very rich, um, nuts, right? And there's plenty of uh, vegetables that are very, uh, that are protein rich as well. Not to mention your whole grains, um, wild rice, you know, whole wheat, these are also have protein. Um, so try to get your nutrients naturally always much better for you your body will actually utilize it better most of the time when you take supplements you just end up um, you know peeing or pooping that out and you've just wasted your money all right don't believe me already you're taking creatine and protein powder before or after your workouts well test it go a couple weeks without it what difference do you feel and see and let me know. Okay, um, I do want to say that um, there there is a, a mass, a muscle mass gain uh, when people take creatine, but it's not actually muscle mass. It's actually water, water retention. So you, you might see if you stop taking your creatine, you might think your muscles have gotten a little bit smaller, but it's just water. Um, if you are working out long enough, like over enough weeks, months, um, you should be able to build up that muscle mass naturally without supplements. And it would be actual muscle mass instead of water. Okay. Um, also the concern with creatine, right, is that we, we don't know if it's safe it looks like after, uh, you know, it could be anywhere from a few years. Um, we don't know how long it takes, but it does look like it will lead to liver and kidney and possibly heart damage. Okay. Also, a lot of people have reported having muscle cramps, um, but, you know, that's what people have reported. Um, but the liver, kidney, and heart damage has been, you know, in experiments with, um, not with people though, but with animals. So that's why I say we're not really, you know, 100% sure exactly what is happening in the human body with these supplements. But certainly anything in excess can be um, harmful, right? So you want to always avoid extremes and you always want to try to do things the natural way. All right. So enough of that, let's move on. Two forces of contraction. You also saw this in lab, active force. This is from myosin, 
binding to actin, pulling it, right, having the power stroke. And this is usually the only thing you think of when you think of um, muscle contraction, right? But you do also have something called a passive force. This is the elastic um, property of muscles and other uh, connective tissue. Uh, one of the main protein, um, Titan, um, is you have probably saw it when you looked at the sacromere, the uh, image of the sacromere, and it showed kind of a, a spring-like uh, protein there, which can compress when you have the muscle contraction and return to normal length at relaxed, but it can also stretch. If you stretch your muscle beyond its normal length, uh, and then it will return like a spring uh, to the resting length. So uh, that's neat. So if you do stretch a muscle past its normal length, you will generate a passive force. But really when we talk about passive force, it's usually only experimentally. Okay. So using your textbook, I want you to, you, again, you're going to pause this video and you're going to write down the definition for isotonic and isometric. And yes, I know you looked at isotonic and isometric in lab, um, but most of you really struggled with it. Uh, so test your memory. What is isotonic contraction? What is isometric contraction? Then I want you to take your backpack that has some things in it. It doesn't have to be super heavy, but a little a little weight to it, okay? And you're going to hold your arm out all the way straight so you have a 90 degree angle, right? And you're gonna tell me what maneuver is that? Is it isotonic or is it isometric? And then you're going to lift it, your hand towards your head, okay? So lift your backpack towards your shoulder um, and then what type is that, isotonic or isometric? Okay, so isotonic, hopefully you paused it, you did all, all the definitions, you did the example, okay? Isotonic, same tension. So this is when your muscle length is changing, but the, um, the tension or force is not changing. So when you move that backpack towards your body, it still weighs the same amount, right? You didn't add anything to the backpack. So your force is the same, but you move the backpack towards your body, you allow that muscle to shorten, to contract, right? So that's isotonic. Isometric literally means iso same metric length, same length. So your muscle stays the same length when you keep your arm out straight and you don't move it, right? Um, so holding the backpack still at an arm's length is an example of isometric. Okay, we use both of these all the time, constantly uh, flowing between the two, okay? So um, don't try to put them in the categories of, you know, you use them both. Isotonic, same tension, isometric, same length, okay? So length tension relationship within a muscle, right? You have uh, at rest, you should have a little overlap of your thin filament, your actin, and your thick filament, myosin. Okay, so notice at the ends or in the A band, right? you have a little bit of overlap. And this gives you room to generate a contraction, right? If you start out like this, how is your myosin head ever going to reach your actin? It's not. So this is not going to work. You will not be able to generate a contraction. You need to have the overlap. And lastly, this is showing something already fully contracted. So if this was your uh, length at rest, you wouldn't be able to do anything either, right? So you need to have at rest, you need to have just a little overlap so that you have space to be able to contract 
this is your full contraction. This should never happen. You would not be able to, to make a contraction at all. Okay, so percentage rest length, looking at how much tension you can generate when you're at a given length. And here we see at the uh, 1.25 micrometers, uh, you're zero, right? So then you move over to um, your 80% rest length, okay? And now you're able to generate a lot of tension. And this is your 1.65 micrometers. And so see this, this contraction, okay? So again, length, tension, relationship, and muscle, you need to have that overlap. So here's your overlap. Okay. So at the bottom, this would be fully contracted. You cannot do any contraction. It's already fully contracted. This is perfect ideal for at rest. Now you can do lots of contracting. This is never going to work right, right there. Never going to be able to generate force. Okay. So one more time. If it's too short, the overlap of mycin, actin, um, if it's too long, the mycin heads can't, um, can't get to the actin. So you need the optimal length, just a little overlap. And I'm not going to ask you for specific numbers, so you don't need to memorize that actual graph. Okay, just the concepts. Um, optimal length, or just a little bit of overlap of mycin and actin, um, will give you the maximum force possible where all of your mycin heads will be able to interact with actin. Fun fact, your muscles do not grow during exercise. Exercise is the stimulus that tells your body you need more. And then your body responds when you're resting and builds up that muscle. Okay. All right, so I told you we'd talk about fast versus slow. So fast fibers, these are going to be uh, large in diameter. Uh, slow fibers are going to be smaller. Uh, fast fibers are going to have a high density of myofibrils, right, actin, myosin. Slow fibers are gonna have more capillaries. And now you should be thinking, oh, more capillaries. That's what the endurance we talked about, being able to have oxygen for a long amount of time before you fatigue. Okay, um, fast fibers are going to have lots of uh, sacromeres, so you can get lots of power very quickly. Slow fibers are going to have more myoglobin. Fast fibers are white in color, so when you think of like chicken meat, right, you have white meat and you have dark meat, and the white meat is in the, the chicken breast, right? Well. Are chickens flying around all day? No, they're walking around all day. They only fly very little short dis uh, distances under, like, if they're threatened, right? So they don't normally fly, so they're not usually using those muscles. Um, so they don't, they don't need red muscle there. They're gonna have the white muscle, okay? But in the chicken leg, you're going to see lots of red because you need to be able to use it all day to stand on and slowly walk around. Okay, so your fast fibers, they're large, they're very powerful, they're white in color, but they fatigue quickly. So this is like sprinting, right? All right, so there you go. And a picture of that help you remember. So long distance runners, they need to have a lot of red, right, capillaries so they can continue to get that oxygen, all of the blood supply, not just oxygen. But they're going to have a lot more red, 
right? Because they have a lot more capillaries. Okay. People who are neither trained as long distance runners or sprinters are going to have pretty even mix. And then people who have trained to be sprinters are going to promote more white fibers will be the white fibers will be predominant. All right, that's the end. We're done. Go take a break. Yay.